praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. I, I don't know how I want us to start this morning. My heart is so full. But I think um, I want us to sing a song. And then um, what I really want to encourage you to do is to make effort to grow in drawing near to God with your entire heart. You know, this is, um, it's funny I'm saying that, but uh, it's just the reality of what this means. There is so much to know in God. There's so much to grow in the spirit. There's so much dominion we can have as we grow. And um, depending on how hungry and desirous you are to press in, to that extent, you become strong in him. You know the way the Bible puts it, that those who do know who they are God. The problem about uh, our spiritual pursuit is that we are not alone in this journey. We're alone in the journey. Any, any of you watched uh, what happened last week about when um, when the Christian community in Saskatoon gathered to affirm or protest, I don't know what they were doing, either affirm or protest the legislature of the, of the, of the provincial government. So, and then um, alongside them, there was also another group that was protesting. One thing you need to know is that the world is not standing and waiting for you to finish whatever you are doing and begin to seek God. If you do not, if we do not wake up, they will overtake us. And uh, I think I mentioned it here last Sunday, or there, I don't know where I did. And somebody said that when the Bible said, those who know their God shall be strong. I don't know whether you realize that Pharaoh and his magicians are one of those who do know their God and they were strong. Do you realize that? I'm not one of the people that believe in witches. But I know there's something like witchcraft. And one of the activities of witchcraft is to deceive you. The Bible says, who has beguiled you? It is to put ideas in your mind that is destructive and with your own hand, you will kill yourself. That's, active, that's, witchcraft, that's witchcraft. So, the people that believe in witchcraft are also pressing in to know more. They are beginning, they are becoming strong. Um, the social movement in the world is pressing in to know more. And whichever group, you know, gets stronger, dominates the world. May it be us. Praise God. I said, may it be us. May it be the, ch the, ch the church. Anyway, um, like I said, it's, um, it's one of those mornings that I, before we do it, let's just pray. You know, I... One of the Michelle, help me grab it. Though. One of the things I, I've been thinking and praying about, and I think I really need to pray more, is to pray for. For us, is to pray for us, because uh, the reason I say is to pray for us is because. The subtlety of the devil is such that he could manipulate people's life without people knowing that it's happening. Just very subtle. He could manipulate people's life without people knowing what is happening. And uh, in your very heart, you will believe you, are, you know what you're doing, but you don't. And that's why Paul said concerning the people of, uh, no, when you are talking about, about the Corinthians, said, he said, we are not ignorant of his uh, devices. So he has so many ways of devising things. And why I say, well, let's learn to pray for ourselves. I don't know how many of you really, in your time of prayer, you will just remember to pray for some members of the church. Pray for your children. You know what I'm talking about. Pray for your 
husband or your wife. Pray for other men, friends that you know, especially those who are Christians, and uh, you are watching them and observing them, and uh, you are, your heart is telling you they are probably not doing very well in their work with God. Pray for them. As you begin to pray for them, God will begin to, you know, give you more body to pray. That's the good thing about prayer. The more you pray, the more you have body to pray. And the more effective you become. So this morning, let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this, your people. And I pray for myself. I ask of God that you remember us. You say that you will give us the spirit and he will abide with us forever. May we understand. May we experience the help of your spirit in all dimensions of our life. May you enlighten our inner man by your spirit. May you grant us the wisdom of the spirit to know the things that you have freely given to us. Father, I pray that you will break every subtle yoke of the devil over the life of your church. Grant understanding to your children in such a way that they will know the hope to which you have called them. And that we will understand the exceeding greatness of your power working in our life. That we have know the access, the keys, O oh God, of the kingdom through which, O oh God, we, are, we can have dominion as you have designed for us to have. I ask you, my God, reveal yourself to your children. Those that, O oh God, that are under demonic spell of deception and distraction and distortion of their mind. Lord, we pray that the yokes be broken over them in the name of Jesus. Release your people to the liberty of your children. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. I would have liked to, us to sing, but I think we don't have much time. Um, we've been, uh, today again, we just uh, have a continuation of our study last week. And one, one thing that we do I'm just going to read through this study. I take time to try to write down this study so that it is easy for us to follow. So please uh, follow me as I read. Um, the first thing I want to define this morning to, uh, with us is what, what the Bible called the grace, of the gospel. Now let me ask the question, without you looking at my study outline, what is the gospel in your own Understanding what do you understand? What is the gospel? My is Michelle. What to talk? Let's know what she want to talk. Okay, tell us. The gospel is four books in the Bible. Is what? Four. I mean, six. no, I don't mean four those are the gospel. Well, no, you're correct. Those are the books that tell us the gospel. They are not. They are called the gospel because they tell us about the gospel. Okay, that's what you understand by the gospel. Okay, that's fine. The gospel is the good news. The good news. Yeah, good. So those four books tell us the good news about the saving power of Jesus. That's why we call them the gospel. Praise God. Um, give to Nathan. Nathan, happy birthday again. Thank you. <laughs> a word that means good news. The good news is about Jesus Christ who came into the world to save us sinners. Okay, praise God. That's the gospel. The good news defined is about Jesus who came to the world to save us. Okay, who else has something to say about the gospel? Uh, yes, the good news that Jesus Christ came to save us because uh, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet rebellious, while we were yet against God, Christ still loved us and died for us. A preacher said that without an assurance that we that are still sinners, rebellious, without an assurance that we are going to accept him, he still came and died for us without an assurance from, from us that we are going to love you in return, that we are going to do whatever you ask us to do, he still came 
and die for us. So that's the good news. We can praise the Lord. While we are still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, just like I said, I want to read this so because of time. Oh. Yeah. In 2 Timothy 2 8, it said, Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from, Dev from David. This is my gospel. So Jesus Christ coming, descendant of David, dying and rising again. The coming, the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, that is a good news. Praise God. Praise the Lord. How defined gospel as spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. The good news about Jesus. Praise God. Okay, uh, we don't read through here. Um, the gospel of grace and redemption, we can see that from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 to 4. If uh, you guys are quick with your hands, you can put it for us. I say, is God's strategy to unveil and grant humanity eternal life? The gospel is God's strategy to unveil and grant humanity eternal life. Now look at what that um, second Corinthians say. Now I will remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you receive. And I want you to pay note, take note of the words, the, those um, phrases there. He said, the gospel which you did what you receive in which you stand, verse 2, and by which you are being saved. If you hold, now, there are so many conditions here, there are so many clauses here. You know, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3, he said, name, what is the gospel now? For I deliver to you as of first importance what I receive that Christ Jesus, Christ died for our sins. This is the gospel. This, I think this is one of the passages that define the gospel very explicitly. You know, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. How did he die? Verse 4. And that he was buried. Well, he died according to the scriptures. He was crucified, isn't it? That's what the scriptures taught. He was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the gospel. So the gospel, the strategy for God, so the gospel is captured in this scripture that we all know, John chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. And it's also here. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but what? Have eternal life. Say, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. So the whole essence of the gospel is to save us. Save us from what? Now, now remember he said that it, it is by the gospel that you are being saved. So what are we saved from? He said from sin, uh -huh. Condemnation, eternal, eternal separation from God, from the grave. So when we talk about salvation, it is all encompassing, but it's encapsulated in these two words, eternal life. Eternal life. What do we how do we define eternal life? How did we define eternal life? What is eternal life? Eternal life means to live forever. To live forever. Mm -hmm. We gave a few definitions of eternal life in our last week's study. You see, I'm trying to be very classroom-like in do doing it because I really want us to have some comprehensive, so that when after this study, you can sit somebody down and tell the person what is the gospel and how do you receive it and how does it change your life so we say that the gospel 
is God's strategy to grant the world, unveil and grant the world eternal life. And we ask the question, what's eternal life? I'm not going to stay there. The gospel is the power. One of the other definitions of the gospel is in Romans chapter 1, verse 6. Say, it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God that can grant salvation. Where the gospel is preached, and I want you to mark that sentence, where the gospel is preached accurately and heartily or truly believed, and steadfastly uh, believe in salvation results. We just read it. When you understand the gospel and believe. Now, uh, last week we talked about believing. When we say, when you say, I believe, what exactly do you mean? When you say, how many of you believe in Jesus, my sister? Mice, you have to be very quick. Just the way you are. You are a very sharp walker. <laughs> Look at the, the, the person behind you. <laughs> when we say we believe in God, we are accepting his spirit in faith. That's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We are accepting his spirit in faith. Okay. Does anybody, another person have? Now, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about believing. Because if you look at, put that first Corinthians again, chapter one, verse, uh, chapter fifteen, verse one and two. You know, he said, "Now um, the gospel which we preach to you and you have received, in which you stand." Verse two. Look at verse two. And by which you are being saved, if you do what? Are we looking at this? At this part? If we hold fast the word I preached, unless you did what? So it actually tells us that we can actually believe in vain. That means that we can believe without receiving, having, receiving the result of what we believed in. There is a way to believe for it to become an access to salvation. And how, what's the way? We talked about it last Sunday. What, how do we believe? There are two ways to believe in, to express our belief or to believe, believe. What are those two ways? We can believe with our hearts. We can believe with our heart. We can also believe with our head. What the difference? Head is something that you just profess and uh, in fact, what, what you just said reminded me what time Jesus was talking to the disciples. He said, He said to them, Let this saying sink deep into you. Do you remember that? He said, Let this saying sink deep into you. That actually means that you can believe, you can hear something, and it hovers over your head. Praise God. When the Bible talks about the parable of the sower. What it defines as a good soil is the heart that actually believe and believe indeed. What it defines as the soil, the seed among the tongues, is the heart, is the person that believes with the head. More of an information than an understanding or acceptance. I don't know how many of you, the way you communicate sometimes. You know, there's sometimes you tell your children something and they are not listening and you say, I, 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 I heard you. I don't know whether any of you experience that. <laughs> what, I heard you. You see, the, that statement, what it means that I heard, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I'm not believing what I'm saying. I'm not taking it. That's what he's saying. So this is the way, the problem that we may have when we are reading the scripture. And you see, let me tell you, for I have a lot of burden in my heart about this because as I review my life and I review the way I have believed, it occurs to me that there are so many things I just have heard. I haven't really believed it. And I'm a preacher, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I'm better than anybody. But there are so many things in the word of God, I've just heard it. 
I had not believed. It's not that, it doesn't mean that I really, because when you believe, when you believe, belief, when you believe, it, it, actually, there's another scripture I remember now. He said, Jesus said to the disciples, if you believe in me, as the scripture have uh, said, do you remember where Jesus said that? He said, those that believe in me, as the scripture have said, out of their bellies we do what? Flow rivers of living what? So he defined believing there as the scripture has uh, said. And he said, when you believe that way, it produces a result. Praise God. Believe it and acting on it. Yeah, I think, I think that's what we're getting at. Believing, you can only act on something you have believed. You know, you see, the Bible, put that first Corinthian, uh, Corinthian again. Let's just review that. I, I really want us to understand something. He said, now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel which I preach and which you have what? What did he say there? And you did not only receive it, he said, you are standing in it. In which you are standing. So, your life has become, you know, ingrained, kind of, part, you know, how do I put it? Rooted into this way of thinking. The idea that God has about the gospel is that when we understand the gospel, it affects us so much that our mouth, our action becomes so synonymous with it because we really believe. Um, were you going to say something, Abby? Just in line with what uh, Sister Blessing said and what you're just saying is from James chapter 2 where he says you believe that there is God and uh, that is James chapter 2 verse 19 that believers that there is one god you say you do well that even the devils also believe and they tremble okay. and then he now says faith without works and then he used abraham so i say believing in god is taking action according to the standard of what he expects of me praise the lord okay i i think i will make progress from that Is there any other question any other um, but I think you are all correct. You are, we are in line with this. So when you really believe, uh, thank you, Jesus. When you really believe, you see, what you believe, you know, you know, whatever you are today is a sum total of what you have believed to be true. And we don't go writing them down and saying that because I believe this is true, this is what I'm doing. In fact, it flows from you. It becomes the core from which your life is lived. The Bible says, put it this way, for out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? The mouth speaks. You know what we show you, and I will want to give you an assignment. As you go home today, through this week, Try to remember or maybe jot down some of the actions you took without thinking about it. And assess, you know, kind of judge yourself. I don't mean judge yourself the way we, but kind of assess it to say, does this show that I really believe in God? <laughs> it will surprise you how many actions we do take every day that is actually that makes it seem as though we don't know that there is a God. Praise God. Brother Charles, it's nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a few weeks. I believe I, gave, I called you a few uh, last week. Did you get my call, no? I hope I have the right number. That's what I was wondering about. We'll talk about it when I, that's what, I think I, I may have a wrong number for you because when I didn't hear from you, I thought maybe I, this is a wrong number for you. Praise God. So, then we define immortality. Immortality is ability to live forever. Immortality, indestructibility in our lives. So, through the gospel, Jesus made immortality accessible, accessible to man by faith in him. Everybody say, by faith in him. 
Now, I want to, again, another thing I need to define with us is faith. What is faith? You know, sometimes when you are having some challenge in your health or situation and somebody said, and you don't want to because we are told not to confess negatively. Remember that? And he said, by faith, I am I'm well. <laughs> Does anybody do put, anybody say that? I'm strong by faith. <laughs> so, so what exactly does that mean? It's that grace. What does that mean? <laughs> the hospital, we don't accept that because some people come. Instead of saying exactly what is wrong, they will say, I'm strong. So what do you mean by I'm strong? Yeah. So they don't want to confess negative and like that. Some people may say I am strong, but they don't actually believe it deep down. So that confession is not right. Okay, so, but what do they, how many people said that? How many people have heard people say, you know, you know, by faith I'm well, by faith it is well, you know? Yeah. Oh, what are those words you usually say, by faith? <laughs> Something by faith. <laughs> uh, let's see, what do you want to say? Okay, okay you heard it. Okay. I think even uh, one of our uh, brother last week was strong. And uh, on the words that we're sending to him, the Lord is your strength, uh, things like that. So that's just the general convention that we find in the Christian dom now. So it's by saying, just as she said, instead of confessing the negative, we turn it to positive. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Take the chance. Uh, chance was what is it? Uh, yeah. We're going to knock off some of these doctrines that ideas that don't that are helpful in our life my personal opinion is that it yeah. became a cliche like a fad yeah it became something that is okay it's a trend people are saying it let me join it let me be saying the same thing yeah because if i'm asking you uh EJ Mahawa, you say i'm strong instantly i know what you're talking about it means you're sick <laughs> <laughs> okay so, so when he say i'm strong you know that he's actually, he's actually sick okay But is uh, you know the Bible said that uh, anything you say, don't speak. Uh, how do you put it? Like by your speak, mouth, by yeah, your, speaking, your, your, speaking positively. Like you just believe. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I agree with you. And when we were growing up, our mom would always said that uh, don't say anything negative because there's power in the tongue. Because whatever you say at cannot be swallowed back. So you mind the things you say at. I think that is. Why would keep saying I'm strong? Just okay, that's that's good. I agree with you. Uh, can you put Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 for me on the on the screen? Let's understand how to make positive confession. It's important we understand how to make positive confession. Romans chapter 10. Verse 9. Say, because let's read it together. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's read it again. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I will put it other, this other way. If you confess with your mouth that you are strong and truly believe in your heart that God has made you strong, you will indeed be strong. Does that make sense to us? The disconnect between our confession and our heart is what makes our confession totally ineffective. <laughs> I remember many years ago. Uh, I've never. I just remember this now. We used to live with a, a young girl, uh, and then one day she started convulsing. Not that, that she's convulsing. She became violent. You no, know, so we oh, 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 that kind of thing. And then we were praying over him. Actually, I was not really there. I think I was somewhere either downstairs or so. And I heard my wife with her voice raised, you know, I bind you, I bind you, I bind you. you know, so when I, I got up, I said, we were still praying, he was still praying for this girl, and I was looking at it, and then we finally calmed her down. 
what occurred to me sometimes that when we the way the emotion and the attitude with which we try to confront the devil seem to suggest to me that we don't really know that we have power over him because when we really believe you know what we say we speak a word i think uh, i always refer to this my uh, I don't, he's not my mentor really i just support it's a preacher that i love his doctrines and his ways you know he said that he was traveling with his wife one of the days and then something happened with the vehicle and then the, i think the tire busted and everything was going uh, the wife said in the name of jesus in the name of he said one he said enough one just one <laughs> just one he said, <laughs> he said i said one is enough just one in jesus is enough to quiet the situation and this is where i think we need to really assess what do we really believe when you truly believe it is in jesus name peace and your heart knows that that is going to happen. But when your heart is fluttering and confused and afraid, you will need to do what? Both shout it and yell it and say it a thousand times, hoping that at one time they will, it will, it will, they will hear. That is not really true heart belief. So the Bible says, if you believe, confess with your mother that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the gospel, isn't it? Now, I want to ask you for a question, every one of you, because it's important that as we are talking about this, I'm not trying to entertain you. Do you really believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord? Do you really believe it? That is, has that become the controlling, controlling, um, emotion of your heart that jesus is lord you know how you know whether you really believe jesus said it's not all that call me lord lord that actually my servants he said but those who do what who do the will of my father he said if you love me you shall do my will so how do you know whether you really believe with your heart the Lord Jesus. You believe, you know it by the way you, you his word impacts upon you. Uh, okay, praise God. So, so today, uh, where, where am I? I think I'm, I'm kind of digressing too much. I want us to be able to so jesus made immortality accessible to, to man by faith in him access to god's promises and provisions is by faith alone access to god's promise and provision is by faith alone in this case we are talking about eternal life praise god access to god's promise and provision is by what faith alone and we are now talking about eternal life it is only by faith that we can access what God has given because it requires you accepting his word to be true. And I want to say that sometimes it will really take a lot of your mental, mental meditation in your mind and asking questions and disabusing your mind of the things that you have believed before for you to come to the point where you say, I now believe that this is the word. This, this is him. Jesus was speaking to his disciples at a point. And he said some things that are very strange. He said, I am the bread of life. If any man does not eat of this bread, he has no life in him. If you do not drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. The Bible says, many of the disciples, hearing that, what he was saying, and I know that maybe if I were in that group, I might be one of the people that would have said that this man is a, a false teacher and leave. They started leaving. And Jesus turned to the apostles and said, will you also leave? Now, I'm trying to just explain to you what it really means to believe with your heart. And Peter said, to where shall we go? You have the word of uh, 
eternal life. Now, that conviction needs to come upon you so strongly that you have no alternative to the word of God when it comes to any matter. That's what it should do for us. That is why Jesus said to Martha, did I not say to you, if you will believe, you would see the glory of God. You see, we are talking about belief this morning. You know, we are talking, about, and, and I, I'm saying this because I really want us to understand what it means to, be, to believe. Okay, the second reason why we know we have, we have overcome death is that, that God, through Jesus, gave us eternal life or indestructible life. God, through Jesus, gave us what? God, through Jesus, gave us... So, God, through Jesus, gave us eternal life. And that is, again, I laid that foundation because I, like, I really want us to understand some of the reasons why we are, not, we are having difficulty with this, our faith. Now, what is the basis for that? It says, First John chapter 5, verse 11 to 12, it says, And this is a testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is where? Is in his son. Whoever has the son has. What do we what do we understand by that? This is a testimony. God has given us eternal, gave us eternal life, and the life He gave us is where in His son. What do you understand? I just want some people to comment. On. What do you understand when you read that scripture? What comes to your mind? Just as uh, we said last uh, week, that in the beginning God created man and made us uh, in His image. In his likeness. So, uh, if not for sin, we will not be in this state today. But God uh, devised a way to rescue us. And he did that through Jesus. So, to have eternal life is that the provision that God has made for us through Jesus, we believe it by faith. Then we, when we die, we have our eternal life back. The original state. That God wants us to be. That is the way I understand it. Praise God. So the question there says how. That's what we are trying to do. John 3.16 summarizes the good news of the gospel through which man is saved from death to life. God's plan in the gospel, God's, God's plan in the gospel destroyed uh, the cause, the power, and the pain of death by Jesus by making Jesus sin. I want us to follow this because I'm just, I wrote this thing down so that you can read it again for yourself. By making Jesus what? Sin. And uh, the atonement for sin. That we can find in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. So Jesus died the death of an offender in our place. But then rose again from dead on the third day by the power of God and never to die again. That's a very long sentence. <laughs> Did we follow it? Jesus died the death of an offender uh, on the, on, but then but then rose again the third day from there the third day by the power of God and never to die again. This must be because the soul that sins shall die. And for the wages of sin is dead. So Jesus tells the apostle after his resurrection that it was necessary that Christ should suffer these things before he enters into glory. I don't know what I'm trying, to, the foundation I'm trying to lay is that how does having that he that has a son in himself has life, how does it come about? 
The mystery of the gospel is that Jesus suffered in the body as a criminal or condemned sinner and ultimately test death for everyone. Jesus suffered in the body and tested death for everyone. Hebrew chapter 2 verse 9. Can, some, can we read it? And First Peter chapter 3 verse 18. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 9. 2 verse 9, not 3. Us, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He tested death for you. Are you following me? <laughs> Jesus did what? Tested death for every one of us. We are trying to see what we are trying to lay is the foundation of how does, you know, having the son gives or give us eternal. Bible says, he that has a son has what? Life. This is God's, the way it will happen. And this is the gospel that if you believe and stand on it, then you are saved by it. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18. First Peter three eighteen. Are you there? He said, "For Christ suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but alive in the spirit." Christ suffered once for sin, that he might. The righteous suffered for the unrighteous. Who is the righteous? Christ. And who is the unrighteous? Me. That he might bring us to God, being put to death. Who was put to death? Are you following that? Remember the Bible said, the soul that sins shall die. But he has not sinned. Yet he was put to death. You see, I believe that many of us know this, but I want this to make more sense to you today. I want you to really believe this in your heart. You know, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Praise the Lord. So, he suffered the death. I thank you, Jesus. He suffered the death that we should die. In exchange for us to what? To have life. We are still laying this foundation. Hence, the Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Everybody say, I have been crucified with Christ. <laughs> what does that mean to you? When we say, I, you have been, I have been crucified with Christ, what does that mean? Now, I want people to talk. I want people to really talk because these are the very common doctrines we have and it's important that we have a reintroduction to this gospel in a manner that it will make sense to you when you make some of the confessions that we make. Death has no power over me. You need to know the basis for it. Okay? I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? Yes, to be crucified with Christ means that um, we are dead to flesh. We are dead to everything we can see, everything that moves man. We are dead to those things. Because we know that there are different levels of relationship with God. Number one, when we give our life to Christ, we pray to God, God give me this, he gives it to you. God give me that, he gives it to you. But the second level of relationship with, with God is when you now say that I'm dead I'm dead to the flesh. Like everybody wants to make me, everybody wants to make it in life. Everybody wants this, everybody wants that. Covetousness and everything is everywhere. But when you are dead, I still don't have that right words to express it. But what I can just say about it is 
when you are dead to your flesh, like nothing in this world moves you. Your level of reasoning, your level of um, meditation and everything is beyond the level of what flesh or what man can say. So your relationship with God is what is really paramount at this level. So we are, when we are, we are dead, dead to the flesh, we are dead to everything we can see, everything that can. So our relationship, our everything is heavenly minded. Praise God. So you, you, you are dead to the flesh. How? How did you die to the flesh? Because you are crucified. But Charles, do you want to say something? Yeah, how did you die to the flesh? Um, by subjecting the, by being master over the flesh. By being master over the flesh. Discipline yourself. You know, discipline and bringing the, self, the flesh under control. Praise God. You see, this is, this is, I, I want us to, I'm just trying to, I'm making a great effort. Uh, Junior, I want to say something. So when I said, you discipline, this, you are applying the death you have already died, isn't it? You are subject, making your flesh live in the state that it has already become. But how did you come to that sta- state? You were crucified with Christ. Is anybody, Okay, just well, yeah, go ahead. Um, in my opinion, because Jesus came for his bride and we're the bride of Christ, and in marriage, you be, two become one, but we were sin, okay. right? Mm-hmm. And that's how he became sin because he became one with us in order to die mm-hmm. so that we can be raised up with him and mm-hmm. have life. Praise God. <laughs> now, let me, let's, let uh, Junior, you want to say something? Let's just amplify what she said. There is a co a coexistence that is the mystery by which we become crucified with Christ. We become crucified. Okay, I think I'm I'm jumping myself. I, I actually explained this down in the study. Okay, Junior, quickly. Okay, I can still remember when we were growing up, and they would tell us. Um, positive confession because this study is very important. You see, if you if you feel like lying or stealing, start confessing. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. <laughs> you still say it finished, and then you go. Ahead. <laughs> so it's not a mental ascent. You know, Paul said, if you live in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So for me, crucifixion is a um, it happened in the Spirit, but for you as an individual, it has to come through the revelation of the, what we are saying. Let this thing make sense. Have a revelation of God, of what he has done on Calvary. And it's not something that happens instantly. It's, it happens instantly, but the knowledge which we are doing on this study is an ongoing process that if you keep on imbibing in your spirit, man, this crucifixion life will become evident for everybody to see. That is what. Okay, praise God. Because of our time, I'm going to go ahead with the study. Now, Apostle Paul affirmed the same mystery. Look at how Paul stated this in our study. Look at our study. Do you not know? Everybody said, do you not know? Probably you don't know, but Paul is trying to inform us that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, we are baptized into his death. What is baptism? What is the literal meaning of baptism? A must kind of infused, is it? Or buried in under. You see, all of us who we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his uh, death. Therefore, but say therefore, we, we are buried with him. <laughs> Praise God. We, we are actually, I think Antrama got this very, you know what we, I'm trying to explain to us today. The co-union we have with Jesus in the way he was going through the suffering that brought us life must done on us so that we can know that after he has been buried and came out we actually have eternal life because he does dies no more. He said we are buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead 
by the glory of the Father, we so we too may walk in the newness of life. So how did you, how were you, how did you get crucified with Christ? Eh? Baptism. Uh -huh. I need a word. I need a, how were we crucified with Christ? How did, it, how did we get crucified with Christ? By faith. Why are you people not uh, trying to catch what I'm trying to catch? <laughs> Repentance. You see how much, how much knowledge we have? By, by being infused in him, he took us in himself. When we are inside, the Bible says, the way that Christ, God was in Christ, the, way, the same way God was in Christ, Jesus carried us inside himself. He, he took our, he, we are united with him. That was say, we are united with him in baptism. That means that you just need to remember that when Jesus was dying, it was that the world was, the humanity was put into Jesus. That's the only reason why he, he has to die. I don't want to confuse you. He did not just only die for all. I'm, I'm reading from my Bible. My, uh, I don't think I, I, I need to be making up more explanation. He did not only die for all, but all died with him. He did not only die for all. Everybody say, he did not only die for all. But all of us died with him. We died with him. Praise God. And we were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. So we are united with him both in death and resurrection including his glorified resurrection life. Now look at in Revelation chapter 1 verse 17 and 18. Can we have it in the board? Jesus, okay, I think th there's no point I have it here. Among other things, Jesus told the Apostle John, I am the living one. Now look at what Jesus was trying to say here. I am the living one. I died. I think I'm, I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Let's read that together. And the living one, ever say, I died. And he is saying that he died. What, what is he telling you about yourself? You died. And I know what, what I'm talking about today will be difficult for you to pray on, but I will share this truth with you. I don't know how long it will take you to actually comprehend it, but I will share it nevertheless. So when he said, I died, I will say to myself, I died. And behold, I am alive. For how long? I don't have enough faith to say the last one that I identify with the last one. But if our co-union with Jesus in everything is true, then it also means that the last one applies to us. Am I correct? Is that right? Praise God. Just one second. So he said, I have the key. Remember what we are trying to talk about is how do we overcome the fear and threat of death with our life. That's what we are trying to, talk, uh, to understand. Okay, just, just quickly because I think we have just five minutes. I have a question. So since we're in Jesus and Jesus is God and Jesus like the second Adam, him coming, is it like the reverse of human creation? Like when Adam was created, a rib was taken out of him to form Eve and Eve is the bride of Adam. And we are the bride of Christ. So is it like the reverse of that to restore the fallen, like the falling of man? I'm not sure I fully understand you. But like, if, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that does the way if was taken from Adam also mean that we are taken from Christ as a church. When Jesus, when Paul was talking about the wife, the man and the wife, he said, I'm talking about Christ and the church. 
He is the head and we are the body. So it, it can be extrapolated, but let's not go there for now. Praise God. So we are united with him. He's dead. Okay, that, that's not where I am. Where am I? Okay, so he, he, will, die, he will not die again. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I don't know what I've lost with people. <laughs> Who is that? Praise God. Yeah, I, this, um, this topic sometimes I think it's hard for us to imagine. And I know we were adopted. So one thing that made me, um, that you said, uh, uh, Canon, was that the whole world died with him. Um, and the, the whole world rose with him. But, but that's potentially. But in reality, the, not everyone has um, accepted that uh, sacrifice and the implications for their eternity. So I was thinking, the, okay, how do we get this? We did not, um, we were not born when he died and or resurrected. So he did it for, he did it for those that were there and those that will come. So, one simple thing came to my mind. I am a Canadian citizen. I was not born in Canada, but I have every right of uh, citizenship that was, um, that was uh, appropriated to maybe centuries ago. And so some people will be born in Canada, they will also get that same right. So, the future people will get it. So, but if I am a Canadian and I don't choose to live, uh, to take hold of all the benefits, all my rights, then I will not enjoy what is made available to me. So that's one thing. So we believe, we did a step to get, acquire the citizenship. Um, even and if you are born here, you may also not fulfill your, I mean, enjoy your benefit. So the thing is that step of faith. Everything is by faith, knowing that I am dead um, to sin. I'm dead, you know. With, I died with Christ. Is the step that came from accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now the next step of eternal life, when he resurrected, that one is also given to me. That power of resurrection is given to every one of us. So for me to be able to live for Christ, it is not by my determination. It is by accepting and taking hold through the Spirit, Holy Spirit, of those things that were done for me. So the same way I believe, like if I believe that the day I asked Jesus into my heart, he made me his child. So everything that was done on Calvary, everything that he did in hell, he did it, I was in him potentially. So it is all mine. Now going forward, what, how, did he, how did the life, eternal life, uh, how am I supposed to live it? Believing that the Holy Spirit is right in me, to say no to the flesh, to say no okay, to the Okay, sorry, I'm, I have to got it. But you have made a point that I want to actually, he said, believe in it. Um, I hope you guys know that not, it's not all Canadian citizens have their right of citizenship. Do you know that? It's not all Canadian citizens that have rights as citizens and can enjoy every privilege that is accorded to everybody. Do you know that? Who are the people that cannot? Criminals and uh, convicted people. <laughs> Those in jail, they, yeah. they lose their right. <laughs> they totally lose their right. They lose their right of freedom. They lose their right of so many things. Okay, praise God. Okay, noble man, everybody, I know you people have done me so many of these questions. <laughs> Mine will be very quick, but um, just going back to what we talked about, about being buried in Christ, 
I'm being raised uh, through him. So does that mean that, because I, I'm just reading that Colossians 2 verse 12, uh, where it says that um, we were in, in baptism, you were raised with Christ through your faith in the active power of God who raised him from the dead. From death. So does that mean that you could still, you could go through baptism, being buried in Christ, but for you to actually be raised with Christ depends on your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Exactly. Exactly. I want you to, this, this is this where we are getting, because you see, the, what I'm trying to, for us to understand it, let us try to understand this doctrine. Let us try to read, understand what actually is done before we start thinking about how to apply it to our life. You see, this is one thing that always happens. Each time we read the Bible, we're always thinking about what we should do before we even understood what God has done. <laughs> what God has done, when he takes root in you, what you should do becomes apparent. But many times, we're always thinking about, oh, no, how to be crucified with Christ. And we are trying to tell ourselves how to be crucified when Jesus was said, you are crucified in me when I was crucified. <laughs> Does that make, do you get what I'm talking about? We try to tell ourselves how to be crucified. The way I'm going to be crucified is that we have to make sure the flesh does not do anything. The flesh does not talk. That's not how you are crucified. And I know that this is confusing. It confused me for many years. The fact of it is that, like Ronke said, that the whole world, Bible actually said that Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. So he, what does that, you know, we are there when Jesus was crucified, you know, they were in no better state or standing in that process than we or the people that we are there that we are not have died and gone. So, the fact of it is that we are, there is something that we need to accept. This is how, what it means to really believe. Jesus died for our sin according to the scripture. And he rose. Now, let me tell you. If I, if we really get into debate, discussing this, do you know that sometimes some of us, and I'm not saying that you're a bad person or a good person by doing that, do not really believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. If, we, if, if you are bombarded with argument and evidence, with science, and they tell you that this is only a story, have you come to believe it so much that nothing can dissuade you from that belief? It might look like I'm being sarcastic, but this is the truth. So in the same way, when the Bible says that he died, and we are in him when he died, he was buried. We are in him when he was buried. He rose. We are with him when he rose. The Bible says, if we be dead with him, we shall also do what? Live with him. Praise God. Okay, uh, time, the time is done. It said, not only so, but God granted Jesus to have life in himself and give this life to all who believe in him. So Jesus died and we never die again. Everybody said, Jesus will never die again. In fact, what, he, what happened, and I'm not going to bother you with this, is that Jesus died wrongfully. He was crucified wrongfully. That was an unjust thing to have done to him. But it was rightly because he died on our place. So, having died and rose again, he paid the price of death that is due for us because of our offenses. Do you believe this? Do you really believe? Do we believe this? He died unjustly, but because he was dying for me, it was just that he died. But because it was unjust for him to have died, he got into the to the to the Hades and was declared that you are not only the person said that I did it for them. I said, uh -uh, you did it for them. How come? He said, so that they will be free. You crucified me unjustly, buried me unjustly, and for that, 
the price of their own condemnation is paid. Do you believe this? And the Bible says, and he rose. And when he rose, and we said this last week, he became, God said, he became a custodian of eternal life. That's why Jesus could say that, my sheep hear my voice, and they do what? And they follow me. And I do what? I give them. He has given me eternal life. Everybody say that. I don't know whether you believe this thing. <laughs> Praise God. Do you really believe this thing? And I want you to, you know, I know that you're saying that, but I know the reason I'm asking you this because it's important that you go home and think, do you really, be, if you really believe this thing? And I want us to take time to meditate on it. He gave me eternal life. Now, there are some scriptures I want us to quickly read. John chapter 3 verse 16, we all know it. Well, how, how does it read? That whosoever believe in him, what are we supposed to believe? What are we supposed to believe? Believe that Jesus died, uh -huh. he was buried, and he rose from dead, and he lives forevermore, and I will live because I rose with him. This is the gospel. So, you know, you know the reason why it's important that you understand the gospel? Because when you understand the gospel, the reason why you should live a different life makes sense. It just makes sense to you. So, when the Bible says, you are not of this world, it makes sense to you. When the Bible says that this shall not be named among you, it makes sense to you. Because you have Bible says you died and you have been translated. There is, you are coming from totally a different place. That's why the Bible says, in view of this, I beseech you that you present your body as what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That is the only reasonable thing to... Are you guys still with me? So, it is... I'm not going to be arguing with brother David why he should not behave like every Nigerian, take him bribe at every corner. It will, it will not be, it will be easy to deal with that. Then in verse 2 he says, do not conform to what? To this world. But be transformed by renewing your mind. Jesus said to the disciples, he said, they are not of this world, even as I am not of this uh, world. So there is a basis for me to not just claim a life that is different, but an experience that is different. Yeah, but my experience must be different. Because I'm not from here. Ah, thank you. Is that making sense to us now? You know, I believe that this is why I should believe God for superior intelligence in my life. I should believe God for superior favor in my life. Because I am not like every other person. I am adopted into a nationhood that is different. And a hefty price is paid for my redemption. So I'm not supposed to be under all this molestation of the devil. And that's why we are talking about last week. I say that is why we must continue to believe and grow in this faith until we can look death or anything on the face and say you have no power over me. Look at any threat in life that threatens people. So when pandemic comes again, we can look at pandemic and say, you cannot come near me. And it's not going to be coming from those, uh, you know, cliche confession that uh, we, we always say, you know, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. And that is not coming from, it's coming from a hard belief. It's coming from something that is settled in your heart that I am, I have a eternal life. I have a life that cannot be destroyed by, the Bible says, if then you are risen with Christ, why are you being subject to all these elementary spirits of the universe? 
touch not, handle not, do not, do not. He said, he said all these things are, you know, are images of the things. He said, the fullness comes in with Christ. So, as I end, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again. And I am with him in the process and in the journey. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's rise up. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that we have, I've not wasted your time. Did I waste your time? Now, if you turn to the back of that page, you will see a lot of scriptures that I have, you know. I'd like you to read those scriptures. I'd like you to read those scriptures and they meditate on them. Every one of them is talking about how we have eternal life. Now, let me, let me, let me just put this to you through. This is the faith to believe God for your complete health and healing and deliverance. This is how to. Total freedom. Salvation is what? Total freedom. This is the basis of upon which you can be praying. You know, we have been praying with kind of this beggarly attitude. He say, devil, leave me alone. I'm not, you know, I cannot, you cannot kill me with this. You cannot. That's not the best the issue. The issue is that he cannot and will never be able to. Okay, let's pray. I just want to ask God this morning to grant you understanding. The Bible said, Paul put it this way, he said that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened that you might know an expansion of your spiritual capacity to perceive and know. Are you praying? God, expand my spiritual capacity. Grant me deep revelation of you. It might not even be just strengthen my mind to be able to grasp this thing, receive this thing, know this thing, accept this thing, picking my heart to learn to believe. Grant me, Father, grace to really believe you. Jesus said to the disciples, Say, Why are you slow in believing all that the prophets have written? Say to God, hear me of slowness of heart in believing. Hear me of slowness of heart in believing. That the things that are written, Jesus said, if you believe in me as the scriptures have said. Oh, Father, thank you. Are you praying? Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Jesus, reveal yourself. The word says the spirit that weakens the flesh gives up by nothing. It is only by your spirit that God that this word can be made flesh, made alive in us. And I pray that God that we will get it. Father, that we may get it. May we get it. May we get it. May we get it, oh God. Grant that we will get it. Grant that we will experience it. Grant, oh God, that the power of resurrection might be so obvious in us and around us. The power of indestructible life. The power of eternal life. A life unlimited and unhindered by any force in the universe. Are you still praying? Are you still praying? Thank you. We worship you. Let your presence fill this place. Let your spirit fill this place. Because he lives we live. Because you live, we live. Because you live, we are more than conquerors through you. 
because you live we overcome for we are seated together with you in the heavenly places because you live father let your people know and experience the life that has been given to them by you in the name of jesus thank you father for in jesus name we pray for in jesus name we pray praise the lord